Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. We're seven months in. Anybody bored yet? Good. This is the longest sermon series in the world, right? But we're doing something called Foundational Framework. And what it is, is we're laying down the foundations that the Bible lays down in order to be able to understand three things so that we understand one big thing. Number one, who is God? Number two, who are people? Number three, what is sin? If we understand who is God, who is man, and what is sin, we will be able to properly comprehend the God-man that takes away sin. A lot of times, one of the greatest mistakes we make with people, especially when we're witnessing to them, beginning the conversation about Jesus Christ, is we start with Jesus. You cannot start with Jesus. We do not live in a culture anymore where everybody's grandmama took them to church. It doesn't happen. Things like vacation Bible school are fading away. Kids are finding all other kinds of things to do, and church is not cool. It's just not. Can't help that. Now, one of the greatest problems we have in American evangelicalism now is we've tried to make church cool. And what we've come up with is the emerging church movement and all this postmodern garbage, and we left the authority of the Scriptures behind. That is a problem, and it is a grave problem, because now we're having to make up for the mishandling of the word by our brothers and sisters in Christ. People are changed one way and one way only, and that is by hearing God's word, period. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. So, with that the case, and wanting to set this foundation so that we all come to this realization together, here are the things we've seen so far, the foundational truths, right at the top of your page. Number one, the Bible is God's self-revelation. Number two, God is eternal, always has been, always will be, kind of like Tom, but greater, right? (laughs) See, he's back now. I sent his wife a sympathy card this week. She had her knee worked on. I said, I'm so sorry for your pain and, and probably the suffering you're going through, but when that knee heals, you'll finally be able to leave the room when Tom opens his mouth. So... Let's, let's, let's not have any, any qualms about what the real pain and suffering is in that relationship. <laughs> so, God is eternal, the sovereign creator. He's over all things. All that he creates is good. Why? Because he is good and is consistent with his character. The third one, man, usins, y'all, are responsible agents held to a moral standard. Whatever God has said is true. You and I are answerable to those truths. Regardless if we believe or not, when we come in contact with that truth, we are responsible to respond. And hopefully by us having the gospel and sharing the gospel, people would hear the gospel and respond to the gospel and so be saved. They're responsible. Sin originates within a person. That's where it comes from. God did not create it. I think that is so important because I'm seeing this more and more in the social media participation I have, that God created sin for his greater glory. He is the author of sin. God does not need anything to be glorified. He is glorified perfectly in the relationship he has with the Son and the Spirit. He does not need sin. If we say that God needs anything, he is not sufficient. He is not reliant upon anything else. Sin originates within us, and it separates us from God. When we talk about death, we're talking about separation. The last one, God declares one righteous. Am I righteous? Here's how you answer that question. It is by faith alone, apart from your works. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you heard the word? Have you believed the word? If you have, you have eternal life, John 5, 24. It's as simple as that. So with those foundational truths, we pick up where we left off last time. And what we left off last week was is an overview of following the promise that God has made to a man named Abram, 
who changed his name into Abraham because he is bringing about the rescue, the deliverance of not just his people, but the proclamation of the goodness of who God is by living through this group of people through Abraham so that the world would take notice of who he is. He wants to be known. He wants to be known. Where we left off was Abraham's grandson, Jacob, now has the promises, and his name has been changed to the name Israel. So we're going to look at Genesis 46. You've turned there in your Bibles, and you need a pen. I was surprised. A lot of you, when you walked in the door today, said, I've got my pen today, which was code for, don't throw anything at me. (laughs) Right? I know that. Now, if I recall correctly, oh, I do. I have candy canes up here to throw, too. And I'm going to throw them until we're rid of them. Anybody want one? They don't hurt much. Excellent. Here we go. I'll pass one to you. Excellent. Now, the sugar's necessary because I've heard the guy preaching today. He's pretty boring. If you wouldn't mind, pass it down. Excellent. Amen. (laughs) Yeah, you are digging a hole. It's one of those things where there's just not a lick of sense in this guy. It's okay. Uh, Chapter 46, look at verse 1. So Israel, not the country, the man, Jacob. So Israel set out with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Now, why is this? We're picking up in the middle of a story that we've left some things off. Why does he pack up everything that he has in a land that God said was one day going to be his? Well, they had a situation. See, Jacob had a lot of sons. And the problem was is that Joseph, one of the younger sons, his brothers hated him. And the reason was is because his father loved him so much. They knew it. They could tell the favoritism that went on from their father. In fact, Jacob went as far as to go down to men's warehouse and get him a real fancy coat, right? All electrified, shiny. I think it's called the Technicolor Dream Coat, isn't that right? Something like that? Amazing. It's amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. It's a coat of many colors. And he adorns Joseph with that coat. His brothers hate that. You ever remember that when you were a kid? Maybe your brother or sister got something really cool, and you're like, ooh, I wanted that so bad. How can I break that or hurt them in order that they can enjoy it? Well, that's the kind of spite that was going on in this relationship. And so one day they decided to plot together all of the brothers, except for Benjamin because he was too young, and Judah because he had enough sense about him, in order to kill their brother. Judah advocates for his life and says, no, 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 don't kill him, don't kill him. And so they make it look like a murder scene happened. They killed a goat, took the blood, threw it all over the special coat, took the coat back to their father, said, wait, we found this, we don't know. And Jacob crumbles. In fact, one of the most emotional accounts you will ever read in the scripture is the grief that Jacob deals with as a father losing his son. Let me show it to you real quick. Look back at chapter 45, verse 27. Because this is when he gets word from his brothers, when Jacob gets word from his son, sorry, who have encountered Joseph because he has ascended to the ranks of second in command in in the land of Egypt. They get word that he's alive, and they come back and they tell their father, Joseph is alive. Look at verse 27. When they told him all the words of Joseph and that he had spoken to them, and when he saw their wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob, what's the word? Revived. Now get this. 22 years had passed. There was something that whenever they brought this coat back with blood smeared all over it, something in Jacob went dark. And it stayed dark for 22 years. And it was only the unthinkable, miraculous news that there is hope. Joseph is alive! It caused the light to come back on again. 
You might be able to identify with that or know somebody that has. It's a hard thing. It's something I can't fathom. I don't have words for that. I don't know. But what we see from here is, is that when the whereabouts of what you thought were lost, no, no, it's still there. It revives him. Then Israel said, it's enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I just want to see his face before I close my eyes to this life. So that's when we get into this idea of why is Jacob setting out? Why is Israel packing up everything he's got and leaving? Do we have that map? Do we have that map, Mitch? Just to show you guys where Beersheba is. Everybody see Beersheba up here? See where it says Negeb? Right here is the promised land of Canaan. They came down here and Jacob stops right there before he begins to cross into this wilderness because he's heading over here into the land of Egypt. He stops there at Beersheba, and that's where he sacrifices. He decides he's going to stop because of the good news that he's heard, and he's going to hold a worship service. When we talk about sacrifices, that's what we're doing. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to atone for my sin and worship God, and I am going to bless his name because of the good things that he's setting before me. And so it says here, verse 2, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Now, hold on to this part. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. This is a big deal. Think of what you know about this story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Did Abraham go down to Egypt? Did he? Wasn't there a famine in the land, and he vacated and went down there, and that's how they ended up with Hagar? Remember that? And he lied. You're so pretty, girl. Tell everybody you're my sister. Everybody remember that? Yeah. Did God tell him to go? There was the problem. He went somewhere. God didn't tell him to go. What about Isaac? Did Isaac go down to Egypt at some point? In fact, he repeated the sin of his father. When he got down there, was here good? it's a good thing. Abraham and Isaac were marrying pretty women, right? That's a good thing. But yeah, they went down there, and, and, and Isaac said, girl, you're so pretty. Lie and say you're my sister. Did people not talk back then? I guess that since he was talking to his son, it was probably that the son wasn't listening, wasn't it? That's probably, that's what I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> not listening. Start breaking Grace Bible Church pens over that one. Anyway, but notice. Do not be afraid to go down. Jacob, you have my blessing to go down into Egypt this time. You can go. For, here's the explanation, I will make you a great nation there. There's the purpose. Egypt is going to serve as an incubator in which to take the people from Israel the man to Israel the nation. I will go down with you to Egypt. God's going to be with them. He's going to walk with him down there. But here's the interesting thing here. And I will also surely bring you up again. Everybody see that word you? I will bring you up again. It's very interesting because that's singular. Which means it's probably collective. Does God bring them up again? Oh, yeah. He holds fast to his word, does he not? So notice, this idea of his word here is to jettison them forward so they can walk in truth. God's going to bring them up. Don't lose hope. God has said it. God will surely do it. And Joseph will close your eyes. So now let's skip down. If you just do a quick scan, you'll see in the rest of 46, you have the majority of it, is all the people who went, 70 in all when you count them. 70 people got up and moved everything they had. And we'll actually look over starting in 46 at verse 31. Because now they show up on the scene it says, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for they have been keepers of livestock and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now both we and our fathers, that here's the reason why, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Anybody got something different besides the word loathsome there? 
Detestable and abomination. Good words. All good words meaning the same thing. When an Egyptian found out that you were a shepherd, they wanted nothing to do with you. They stayed away from you. Now, why would this possibly be profitable? Let's read this next little section and we'll look at that. Verse, uh, chapter 47, verse 1. Don't let the 47 mess you up. Then Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, and he said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. Exact same thing that Joseph told him to say. He says here, Pharaoh said, We have come, or I'm sorry, they said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land for, here's the reason why, there's no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, now this just goes to show you how different this Pharaoh is from the Pharaoh that comes on the scene in the Exodus and deals with Moses. The Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best, everybody get this, what is Goshen? It's the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know of any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Now, Pharaoh just met these guys. But notice his trust relationship with Joseph was as such that when Joseph recommended them to come there, you know what? Joseph's good with you. I'm good with you. Here, be in charge of my sheep and stuff as well. Now, that's, it pays to know somebody, doesn't it? That's a good place to be. Now, why Goshen? Everybody see Goshen over here? This right here is where Pharaoh would have had his operation set up down in this section. Goshen is far enough away. And what do you see that's all throughout Goshen? Water, which means what? Pastures, green, green grass. And if any of you have got livestock, what do they love? Green, green grass, right? So notice we have so many livestock. We need a section that's going to be able to adequately fill so that this perpetuates forward. Now, here's another good thing about this. Notice how set apart Goshen is from where Pharaoh would have been ruling for. Everybody see that? Now, does Pharaoh worship the one true God, Yahweh, creator of all things? No, in fact, they worship many different gods. Thousands of gods. And they're building statues to those gods and sacrificing to those gods and trusting those gods for certain things. Probably the most famous one we know of is Ra, right? The God of the sun. Notice how inadequate he is. He can only be over the sun. Our God's over all things. Way to go, Ra, right? We can have that kind of attitude about it. Why? Because our God is superior. So notice when you set them apart in that section instead of down there, what you're doing is, is you are segmenting them so they don't fall prey easily to idolatry. Now, remember, we said that shepherds are what to Egyptians? An abomination, detestable, loathsome. You know what that keeps them from doing? Cohabitating. No intermarriage. The Jews stay the Jews. And the line doesn't get messed up. Why? Because God is trying to do something. Because God is doing something great and growing them into a nation. So now, something interesting I want to just skim and scan and show you. Look over at same chapter, 47, look at verse 14. And I want you to notice this verse. Joseph gathered all. Now, remember what we said the word all means earlier? All of it. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt because the famine was there but they had prepared for it in advance by God's wisdom given to Joseph. And in the land of where? Canaan, where they came from. We had to flee that place because there's nothing left to eat there. So we came here and now you guys are going to take care of us? That's great. Thank you so much. For the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Did Pharaoh get rich? Oh, buddy. Now look down at verse 16. Then Joseph said, because now we're out of money, but we still need to eat. What are we going to do? Joseph said, give up your what? Livestock, all your cattle, hand them over, and I'll give you a grain in exchange for that. And I'll give you food for your livestock since your money is gone. Did Pharaoh get rich in livestock? Yes, he did. How about look down in verse 18. 
When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent, right? Verse 14. And look at the next part here. And that the cattle are my Lord's. Verse 16. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. Okay? So watch this. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. In other words, Pharaoh just got really rich in real estate. In fact, we find out that he ends up owning everything except the places where the priests of Egypt owned. He owns it all, all of it. Now, is that a good chunk of land? Yep, that's a good chunk of land. Build you some hotels there and have a good time, right? But not only that, he got the people that lived in the land. And now they've willingly become his servants just so they could live and stay alive. Now, this is interesting. Verse 24, here's some instructions from Joseph. Oh, sorry, let's do 23. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now, here is seed for you that you may sow the land. And at the harvest, you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, 20%, and four fifths, 80%, shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for those of your households and as food for your little ones. So they said, man, this is a bum deal. I don't know if I like this. Let's get out of this. I want a refund. Is that what they say? No, they say, you've saved our life. You have saved our lives. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Now, has Joseph been used well to build a nice little empire for Pharaoh in Egypt? He has been. He's been faithful in that calling. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to chapter 48. The children of Israel have, or sorry, Jacob and his sons and their families have been living in Egypt now about 17 years. And Jacob is getting ready to die. Chapter 48, verse 1. Now it came about after these things that Joseph was told, Behold, your father is sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh, the older, and Ephraim, the younger, with him. When it was told to Jacob, Behold, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel collected his strength and he sat up in bed. And then Jacob said to Joseph, Now watch this, he's going to recount something. El Shaddai, right? El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God that is strong, the one who supplies in urgent need. Notice the word El Shaddai is used any time that this promise is communicated. And everybody see the word lose there? Everybody remember that? Anybody remember what Jacob recalled that after the experience he had there? Bethel, house of God is what it means. He renamed lose house of God. Now this is after Jacob's time with Laban, marrying Leah and Rachel, having a lot of the kids, journeying back. He comes to the same place that he had named Bethel before, and God appears to him again, and that's when he wrestles with the angel. And this is what he's recounting here. And notice what he says here. El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and did what? Blessed me. Blessing. First component. And he said to me, behold, I will make you, number one, fruitful. And number two, what? Numerous. Not just fruitful, but numerous. Does everybody see that part of the Abrahamic covenant as well? Remember, blessing, land, seed, the offspring promise. There you go. Number three, I will make you a company of peoples. And number four, and I will give you this what? Land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. Remember, we said this last week, but we can't say it enough. Who owns the land? Israel. Israel owns the land because God gave it to them as an everlasting possession. Now, if that means temporary, you and I have a lot of scary things that just happen in our minds about everlasting life. Everybody see how that works? So in order to be consistent with what we're talking about and God laying the foundation of explaining even the word everlasting, it is always yours. It definitely has implications for us when we talk about what is it to receive everlasting life from Jesus Christ. Very important. Verse 5, now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Now, if they were brats, I'm sure Joseph was like, cool, 
right? That's supposed to be funny. Who didn't have coffee? Come on. Okay, never mind. But notice that Jacob immediately takes his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and he adopts them into his family. If you want an interesting study sometime, if you really want to exercise your brain with the scriptures, go through and look for every listing to where the 12 tribes of Israel are listed out and see who is represented. Would you like to do some of that? No, largely no. But here's the interesting thing. We'll we'll, we'll look at some of it. There are some instances where you don't find certain sons mentioned, and there's problems. There's problems in the family. Watch this real quick. Verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 5. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as in the same way that Reuben and Simeon are. Reuben's the firstborn. Simeon is the secondborn. Levi is the thirdborn. Judah is the fourthborn. Now, this is really important that we get this. Why does he bring this up? Two reasons. Number one, it shows the adoption of these children who are not mine are assimilated into my family with equal acceptance, recognition, and the opportunity for inheritance, just like my natural born kids. Now, that idea of adoption, as we see played out physically in this situation has a lot of bearing on our understanding of the New Testament concept of the adoption of sons that we receive when we believe in Jesus. Fully accepted into the family as if the bloodline was of his own. Fully recognized and fully awaiting the receiving of inheritance. There's no schism. There's no division. There's no, well, I just don't love you as much as these kids who came actually from our bodies. There's none of that. They're fully accepted into the family. But look also what happens here. But your offspring that have been born after them shall be yours. They, Manasseh and Ephraim, shall be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. Now, this is important because of the second reason why their names are are brought up. Look over at chapter 49. Jacob's getting ready to die, but he's going to give a pronunciation of blessing on each one of the children that completely corresponds with their character of who they are. And we're not going to go through all of it, but I want to hit some major points to show you something. Chapter 49, verse 1, then Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Notice it's prophetic is what it is. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. Now watch this. Preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Sound good? Hold on. Verse 4, uncontrolled as water. You ever filled up a basin and tried to move it from point A to point B? You get wet feet, don't you? Uncontrolled. You are unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence. Now stop. Notice what he's saying. You could have been preeminent in dignity. You could have been preeminent in power. You had the opportunity of the firstborn, and as the firstborn, you have double portion of inheritance. All of your brothers would have looked to you for guidance as the firstborn child. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace. To our